great fortitude to believe and hope and love. For your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. First lesson before this is eight Sunday after the Pentecost, we take it from the book of Isaiah, the first two verses of which will serve as our sermon text for this, for this morning. Isaiah writes, As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without water and earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields heat for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees will be able to clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, will grow the juniper, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord to renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Happy are they who hear the word. Holy and fast and an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit to the patience. Hallelujah. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel is again the parable of the sword, and it's found in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It spread up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no roots. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times above the soil. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no roots, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorn refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces the crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times of the soul. This is the gospel of the Lord.
God's grace and mercy and peace all are yours through the work of Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior. Amen. Our text for this morning on the from the after Pentecost is taken from the gospel from the actually some people call it Isaiah's Gospel, because Isaiah's gospel is good news. Um, but it's from Isaiah's prophecy, chapter fifty five, verses ten and eleven. I'll read those verses one more time. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making a mud and flourish, so that it yields heat to the sore and bread to the heater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to be empty, it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I am sent. This is God's word, may we always learn and benefit from that word of God. Your brothers and your sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. You don't have to be a farmer to know the importance of water for the crops. I, I think we learned that in, in grade school for the most part. It's almost logical, it's almost second-hand knowledge that if you don't have water, things are not going to grow. When, when people are looking at different planets that have been discovered, and they're wondering, could there be life on a different planet? They judge it based on whether or not there is water on that planet. Because where there is no water, there is no life. That's a general rule for anything in this world. You need water in order to grow. For farmers or gardeners, you know that very, very well. You, you put a seed in the ground, but unless it has moisture to help germinate, to help it grow and mature and bud, and flourish, and then 60, 70, 80, 90 days after it was planted in the ground, then it become a harvest. Unless you have water, you don't get that kind of harvest. Or, or, or your harvest can be much, much less than what you had hoped for, or what it was supposed to be. You, you, you need water. You need rain at the right time. Coming back from vacation a couple of weeks ago, I could tell without even knowing that there had been rain. Because the corn that was already way past knee high by, by the 4th of July, about the time that we left, was way past test time and when I got back. And it, of course that's due to warm, moist weather, but it's also the moisture that fell because I know for a fact that there was water that came down in plentiful amounts during that week, at least two or three times according to my, my mother-in-law. Snow too. Here in the Midwest, we get snow in the winter time. And then when you get snow, you get lots of snow that blankets the ground. And the snow does the very same thing that the water does, even in a better way, because sometimes when you get the, the toad stranglers or the belly washers that you get in summer, where tons of rain comes down in a short amount of time, and a lot of it is not put to good use, it just runs off. In the wintertime, you get snow, and as they, I think, to go is you get 10 inches, doesn't that equal about one inch of moisture, one inch of rain? And so that by the time the spring comes, that's all in the ground evenly. And the farmer gets the benefit of already in the soil a lot of the moisture for whatever seed that they plant in the ground to grow. Farmers, doesn't take the farmer to know that you need water or growth. Now, now most of the time you take that for granted here in the upper Midwest because we get the rain when we need it. The rain comes when it's dry, then it comes, it helps the, the crops grow. I've lived a couple other places in my lifetime where that was not the case always. In Denver, which is a very arid climate, they have people that were always elected to what they call the Water Conservation Board. And those were some of the most powerful people in the state because they controlled where the waters of the Colorado River, which got its rain from the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, and then funneled into the Colorado River down through the heart of Colorado in the agricultural community. They controlled where that water went, when the water was released, and how much water was released. They were extremely powerful people if you were on that water conservation board. People love being on that board. You have power because you knew when and where the water was going to go. 
in, in, in Oklahoma City, I remember very often dry, hot summers where you could not just go out and turn your hose on for the garden or if you wanted to water the lawn because they had what they called water police. And if you were in Oklahoma City, very often they still do this, they say that you can only water on odd number days or even number days. And if you think that's kind of a laugh, they have people that would drive around different neighborhoods in Oklahoma City, and if they saw you watering on the wrong day, you would be fine. And the fine was a, a good one as well. Water is precious. Here we take it for granted. Isaiah doesn't want us to take it for granted. As a matter of fact, Isaiah wants to impress upon us that every time that you see water coming down from the clouds, in essence, from heaven, from God's hand. Every time you see snow come down from the heaven in the wintertime, think of, he says, what that water does to the ground, and let that remind you of what God's word does to the seed that has been planted in our hearts. Because just like crops do not grow without water, so also our faith does not grow without the water of God's word. And if you think that that's not the case, <laughs> Take a look at all the times in God's Word where He says, if you do not stay connected, if you do not stay rooted in me, built and fed by the water of God's Word, guess what? Over and over, dead, dry bundles that were good for what? Nothing except for the burn pile. That's the picture that God, through Isaiah, is trying to give us for this morning. God's Word works the way that He wants it to work. Through Isaiah's words here, God wants to remind us that water is extremely important for the farmer, but God's word is also extremely important for the soul. As the water soaks into the earth and brings forth good fruits and good harvests, so also God's word soaks into our soul. Whenever we hear it, whenever we pick up a Bible, whenever we read a meditation, and it grows your faith just like God says it was. In other words, God's word works. We don't need anything besides God's word. We don't want to detract from God's word, but we don't really need any gimmicks. We just need God's word. The Holy Spirit works through that word. It doesn't just promise a miracle and then not come through. Kind of like, sometimes I wonder about the, the latest gadget on TV. How, how does the one thing that you can plug in on your kitchen counter. How can that fry something? And how can that bake something? And how can that broil something? All in the same place at the same time. They, they make claims that I, I wonder if they could possibly be true. So also when God says, my word will do wonders when it is planted and it waters your faith, it always works the way God wants it to. So, so the question for this morning is, why, why would God feel the need to tell us this? Because as I said before, this is pretty, pretty common knowledge. When you were kids, your parents might have told you that the waters come from the heavens. They come from God, and that's true. But God also works for science. And so in third or fourth grade, you read about how the science of water works, where it is evaporated in the oceans and the lakes, it comes into the clouds, the air currents take it to different places, and then it rains and it waters the earth. That's what God is talking about in our text for this morning. This is not new, it's not new science to us, but it's something that we need to hear because plenty of people don't believe it. They don't think that they need to hear God's word on a regular basis. They think that they can do it on their own. They think that they can do just fine on their own without the regular nourishment of God's Word. Tell a farmer that his crops are going to be just fine without any water from the heavens, and they will laugh at you. So also, God says, no, you cannot do it on your own. You need the regular nourishment from the rain that comes down from the heavens. Here's another reason why God tells us something that should be just second nature to us. Over the years, I've had dozens, probably hundreds of people who have come into my office and they've given me challenge A or problem B or I'm troubled by this or that or the other thing. And after they get done telling me what is troubling them, their problems are, they say, I have no idea where to go. 
tried everything. I don't know where to turn. What should I what should I do? The reason that God wants us to think of his word as the rain that does something for the ground is because he also wants us to have that same confidence in his word. We, we touched on this last week just a little bit, where we may know God's word. We might have memorized God's word, passages upon passages in our lives, and we have them in our heads. We could write them down for you. But when it comes to translating from our heads to our hearts, from my knowledge to actually trust in God and put them into practice, like Jesus said in the, in the, in the Gospel this morning, he who has ears, let them hear. You don't just, you've got ear. You've got ears, you don't use them. You have ears so that you can use them. He who has ears, listen to my word, Jesus is saying. So, so that's what God wants us to think of when we think of the rain coming down from heaven. Instead of wondering where can we go or what should we do or I have no idea how I'm going to face this predicament or this challenge in my lifetime, God tells us, use the ears that God has given you. Use the word that God has given you. Hear it or read it or digest it in some form or fashion. And then trust that my words can and will help you. Take the opportunities that you have to get to God's house. Take the extra opportunities to study God's word on your own, and you'll benefit. And, and, and you won't ask the question, I don't know where to go. So, so when you do have that problem with that child, that wayward child, or, or when you have that marriage issue that's, that's making struggles of your marriage, or when you have that dead-end job that you wish that you could try something else, or you have that person at work that you just cannot stand and cannot get along with, and you don't know what to do, should I quit? He should quit. Where should I do? What should I do? And, and you go to the pastor with those problems, the pastor will say, you know, you might have tried a lot of other things. Here's something else to try. Open this book. And it's God's word. And it talks about marriage. And it talks about parenting. And it talks about how we can have the peace that goes beyond understanding. God's word works in the way that God intends it. As Isaiah said, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. He will not return to me empty, but will achieve the purpose that I desire and give you what you need at the proper time. The, the best place where God connects to his children is in his word. And so the best place to connect with God is in his word if you're in church. Or when you're opening your Bible at your kitchen table at home. Because then God uses that word to comfort when comfort is necessary, or to encourage when encouragement is necessary, or maybe to prick our hearts, our consciences, when that is necessary. God's word works in all kinds of fashions. When, when people need God's word as God's law, God sends the hand of his law. And it's supposed to prick our consciences, and it's supposed to leave a bitter taste in our mouth. But he also gives us the gospel soon after that, which reminds us that it's not a bitter taste that God wants to give in my mouth, but it's a sweet taste. The, the psalmist even talks about the, the, the sweet taste of honey in my mouth. That's what God's word does. It works specifically in the ear, whatever they need in their lives. If you go back two chapters, actually these two chapters from our text here, you hear Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 54. Those are two of the most beautiful Old Testament chapters that talk about what Jesus was going to do. Isaiah writes about this suffering servant, and, and you're, you're, you're wondering if you read Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 54, what is this suffering servant? And who is this suffering servant? And why is he suffering? And why is he serving? And then from the benefit of hindsight, the Gospels tell us that Isaiah was talking about Jesus who was crushed for our iniquities. He was whipped and beaten for the, for the sins that we have committed in our lives. He went to the cross so that we would not have to go to hell. Jesus did that so that we might have comfort and have the encouragement, have the peace that goes beyond understanding. It's a story that we've heard countless times. It's a story that we need to hear countless times in our life as well. Years ago, it doesn't happen but very much anymore, but when, when our family would go out for vacation, um, a 
picnics, which happen very rarely. But if we were out and about and my wife thought, this is a perfect photo op. Maybe we could put this on a Christmas card and send it to the, our family and friends. And, and, and we would pack up and, and, and she would arrange us at the perfect spot where she thought in her own mind, this is going to be the perfect place to have a picture that might go on the Christmas card or for posterity. But then very often, um, the rains would come and the clouds would get darker and she would look at the rains and she would say, I've got to get this picture in fast. And then all of a sudden she couldn't get the picture in fast enough and the rains were coming and she would get so upset that the rain was ruined in her photo op. Livid to the point, I can't believe this is ruining this photo, this is ruining this picture. And she found out over the course of the years that I didn't give her a whole lot of sympathy. Not because I don't love her, I love her, but because it's supposed to remind us of something. Every time you see the rain coming down from heaven, or, or, or when you're in the winter time and, and the, the, the winter snows are keeping you in, keeping you from what you want to do, or the rain is keeping you from what you want to do, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, but the rain is not letting you do that. Don't take it as a as a bad thing. Take it the way that Isaiah wants you to take it. That when you hear the rain on the road, or when you see the snow coming down, and then you are reminded of the fact that in spring, the farmers are going to enjoy the fact that it rained whenever it rained. They need it for their crops to grow. I guess that so also the same thing happens with God's Word. The Word that God sends out from His mouth, in His Word, in Sunday school, in Bible class, in the meditations, in whatever way that you are connected to God's Word and the cross that Jesus died on in His Word, that is always good for us. It achieves the purpose for which God intended it. It will not return to God empty or in vain. It does what God wants it to do. And the church that remembers that, and the members who remember that, and focus on hearing and being connected to God's word, they will see that fact. That God's word never returns empty, but will always do what God says it will do. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will start to keep our hearts and our minds in the true faith. We can best our Christian faith together with the words of the night. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ.
Deliver them according to your will. Strengthen and preserve their faith, that they might rejoice in the sufferings of this present time, are not worth preparing for the glory that is to come. Lord Jesus, until we share your wedding feast in heaven, grant that we may receive you by faith in your holy supper. As we do this morning, may we humbly rejoice in your real presence here for our forgiveness, our life, and our salvation. Heavenly Father, we also remember the family of Eleanor and Annas, whose daughter Ellen passed away this past week. We seek refuge in your love, for you have assured us that it is more than sufficient for our weakness. Be those who are to look to you for strength, sustain them with your tender hand, and grant them peace. Into your hands, Lord, we commit all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we do not have the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for our Thank you. 